look at uh, some scripture with you this morning. Tom mentioned we're going to be celebrating communion together in just a few moments. Uh, and as I was thinking about that this week, this scripture came to mind. Sometimes scripture can be a little bit overwhelming. And sometimes the Christian life and what it means to serve God can be overwhelming because there seems like that there is so much. I was looking at my Bible here and depending on what version yours is or what edition and how large the print is, of course this varies, but my particular Bible has 1,100 pages in it. How many people know everything that every page in your Bible has to say? Anybody? No, me either. There's a lot in there. And sometimes it can be overwhelming. There's a lot of things that we can talk about when we come together. If you come here on a regular basis, you know there are lots of things we talk about. Lots of scripture that we read and lots of things that God asks of us and wants us to do. And, and a lot of aspects of serving God and being a disciple of Christ. That's what we talk about when we're here together. And then on top of that, there are a lot of different opinions about some of those things that are in the scripture. Rob and I have been working together this week, and we've been having some good conversations about some parts of Scripture that are open to interpretation, aren't they, Rob? There's a lot of ways that you can look at some of these things, and a lot of different opinions out there and viewpoints, and there's a lot of things to keep track of. And I've shared with you before that I am the owner of a very simple mind, and sometimes I just need to simplify Sometimes I need to look at all of that, everything that's out there, all of Scripture and all that we're challenged with and all that we are tasked with, and I just need to simplify it. As we think about communion this morning, and in particular as we think about this passage in Colossians chapter 1, I think that we can do that. And when we simplify all that Scripture has to say, we come down to one very important place, and that is Jesus Christ. We come all the way down, we take all of Scripture, all 1,100 pages, all 66 books, all 1,200 chapters, and we bring it all down to one place, and we end up with Christ. Jesus Christ must be the focal point of our lives. He alone is worthy of our admiration. He alone is worthy of our worship, our attention. And I want you to listen to what Paul has to say about Christ in Colossians chapter 1. I just want to read a few verses, look at them briefly, and then we're going to celebrate communion together. But Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says this, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. So let's just pause right here a second and look at who we see Christ is. Right off the bat, Paul says, Jesus Christ is God. He is God. We can't see God. John chapter 4, verse 24 says, God is spirit. We can't see a spirit. We cannot see God. And yet Jesus Christ is is the visible image of the invisible God. That is, Jesus Christ, Philippians 2 says, became flesh. He took on a human body so that we could see Him. And those who lived in that day when Christ was walking on this earth were able to see Him, and when they saw Him, they were in fact seeing God because Jesus Christ is God. I want you to notice there it says he existed before anything was created. Jesus Christ is eternal. If you look at John chapter 1, it says he was in existence before anything was created. He's God. And that's why he needs to be our focus. Look at verse 16. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through Him and for Him. He existed before anything else, and He holds all creation together. Not only is He God, but He is the Creator. Without Jesus Christ, 
The world doesn't exist. It's hard for us to imagine that because, of course, this is what we know. As far as we're concerned, this is existence. But the Scripture tells us that Christ existed before all of this. And He is the one that created it. So if it wasn't for God, if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, none of this would be here and none of us would be here. He created it, it says here, for Himself. See, here's a fundamental issue that our culture has with this world. We think that the world was created for us. You ever heard anybody out there, any of the talking heads, talking about this world? They think it was created for them. We think it was created for us. But in fact, the Scripture says that Jesus Christ created it for Himself. And everything in it, and everything that has happened or is accomplished in it, needs to be done for Christ. Because he created it for himself. Everything, the things we can see and the things that we cannot see. And by the way, verse 17 also tells us that he is the one who holds it all together. Now I want to be careful when I say this because I don't want everybody to go run screaming out of this room and say, Pastor Mike doesn't care about our world. Because that's not what I'm going to say. But I am going to say this. There's a lot of panic in our world about making sure we don't do anything that's going to cause our world to fall apart. Now again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be responsible with what God has entrusted to us. We should. But here's something that you don't ever have to worry about. You don't ever have to worry about this world falling apart and disintegrating Because of something that we have done. Because do you know who holds this world together? Jesus Christ. He sustains it. He takes care of it. He makes sure it keeps rotating and spinning around the sun. He makes sure the angle is right. He makes sure the sun is warm enough to sustain life, but not too warm to incinerate life. He's the one who makes sure that asteroids and meteorites and falling stars don't destroy this earth. He is the one that makes sure the whole solar system doesn't spin out of orbit and implode. He is the one who does that, not us. We think we're in control. We think we're the ones that are doing all of this, but we're not. Christ is. And that is why he needs to be the focal point of our lives. Look at verse 18. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. Christ is not only God, he's not only the creator, but he's the head of the church. Christ is the one who is in charge here. It's his desires that we need to be concerned about, not ours. If there ever comes to be a point where I am doing something that Christ does not want us to do, then you need to pick me up and you need to throw me out of here. Because Christ is the one who is in charge. He's the head. He is the one who decides what we should be doing and not doing. And if we're running the show, then something is wrong. I want you to notice at the end of that verse 18, Paul says, so he is first in everything. You know, there is a little bit of a trickle down here. Not only is Christ the head of the church, but obviously as he is the head of the church, he needs to be head of the Christ follower too, right? He needs to be the head of each individual disciple. And so when we read this verse, not only do we need to understand the fact that Christ needs to be in charge, He needs to be running this show, He needs to be running our lives too. And when Paul says, He is first in everything, what we really need to be asking ourselves is this, is He first in everything in my life? 
Because you could go out from here and say, hey, I am confident that Christ is first in our church. I am constant, confident that he is running the show, that he is in charge, that Pastor Mike and Pastor Tim are listening to him and doing what he wants our church to do. That's excellent and that's important. But is he first in your life too? Because that's what it means when he says he is first in everything. Look at verse 19. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself, and he made peace with everything in heaven on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Not only is Christ God, not only is he the creator, not only is he the head of the church, but he is the savior. Christ makes it possible for everything to be right. He is the reconciler. Paul also talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We've looked at those verses not too long ago. Remember when we were talking about this, that part of our responsibility as disciples of Christ is to call people. Do you remember that? And we are to call them and we are to say, come back to God. That can only be done through Christ because he is the Savior. He is the reconciler. He is the one who can restore the people and the affairs of this earth to what he intended them to be. Let me ask you a question. As you look around this world, and you see everything that's going on, do you think that this is what God intended for our world to be? As you see everything that's going on all around the world, you think this is what God intended? When you look at our community, this place, this part of Maine where we live, and you see all that is taking place, do you think that everything is happening the way that God intended for it to happen when he created this world? One more question. When you look at your life, do you think that everything in your life is happening the way that God intended for it to happen? You know what our world needs? You know what our community needs? Do you know what we need? We need a Savior. We need someone just like Jesus Christ who can come and reconcile, who can make things right, who can restore our lives, our communities, our world to what God intended them to be. Because I got to tell you what, everything is out of whack. When I read and I watch and I hear some of the things that are going on in our world and our communities, I think, what in the world is going on? How can people possibly think that that is a good idea? How can people possibly think that this is the way life should be? And then I remember something. This world is out of sync. Our communities are out of sync. Often our lives are out of sync. We need a savior. We need a reconciler. Someone who can come in and set things right. He says he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth. Jesus Christ makes peace. That's what we need, isn't it? We need peace. We need peace with God. We need peace with each other. We need peace in this world. How does he do it? That says so right there in verse 20. He does it by means of Christ's blood on the cross. His blood on the cross. Look at verse 21. 
This includes you who were once far away from God. You were His enemies, separated from Him by your evil thoughts and actions. You know what the most encouraging thing to me is of this whole passage? This whole book? That this reconciling, this saving, this making peace, this making whole, this putting back in sync that Paul is talking about here, look at the first two words, or first three words of verse 21. What does it say? This includes you. When Christ came to this earth to set everything back the way that God intended it to be, it says that He did that, He provided that way for everything. Guess what God meant when He said everything? Think, don't answer quickly. What do you think He meant when He said everything? Anyone? Everything. Excellent, Dan, move to the head of the class. Thank you for being bold enough to step out on a limb. When God says everything, He means everything. And that includes you. It includes me. We were far from God. In fact, so far from God that we're His enemies. And it's possible this morning that right now you are far from God. But this reconciliation, this saving, this making things right, this putting things back the way that God intended them, includes you. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, it doesn't matter, it includes you, because God says everything. Look at verse 22. Yet now He has reconciled you to Himself, through the death of Christ in His physical body. As a result, He has brought you into His own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before Him without a single fault. How is it possible? How does God do that? How does He make everything right? He does it through the death of Christ on the cross. That's what we're commemorating when we celebrate communion. That's what we're talking about when we gather here on Sundays, friends. We are talking about the fact that Jesus Christ, who is God, the creator of this universe, died on a cross, literally shed His blood, so that you could be made right with God, so that you could be brought back into the family. Your thoughts, your actions, your words separate you from God. Mine do too. But because of Christ's sacrifice, listen to this verse. We are brought into His presence. There is a tremendous privilege there that I think that we all take for granted at one point or another. And a lot of us take it for granted a lot. Often. Because of what Christ has done for us, we are brought into the presence of God. The presence of God. I don't know about you guys sitting here today, but I have to tell you something. There are lots of days when I do not deserve to be in the presence of God. Okay? Because of the things that I say and think and do. You know what? Actually, Scripture tells us that there is no day in which I deserve to be in the presence of God. But here I am in the presence of God because of Christ. What does he say? You are holy and blameless as you stand before Him. 
Now, I know you don't know me like I know me, but I just need to tell you this morning that I am not holy and I am not blameless. I don't want to cast aspersions on your character this morning, but I'm reasonably certain that you are not holy, nor are you blameless either. But look at how God sees us because of what Christ did. Holy and blameless. As you stand before him, listen to this, without a single fault. Without a single fault. Now, I don't care how well you think you have your life put together. I am hoping that you don't think you have it so together that you don't even have a single fault. But because of Jesus Christ, we stand before him holy and blameless without a single fault. Know this. Our separation from God was all us. My separation from God is all me. I did that all by myself. And you did it all by yourself. But your reconciliation to God is all Christ. You did it all when it came to separating yourself from God, but he did it all in terms of reconciling you to God. You, nor I, neither of us, can do anything, not one single thing, to get us back to that place of standing in the presence of God. You can't do anything. If you think you have done one thing, if we were to turn it into percentages, if you were to say, it's 99% Jesus Christ and 1% me because I am trying really hard, you're wrong. Not 1%, nothing. It's all Christ. Several hundred years ago, I don't know how many of you are students of history or not, but Several hundred years ago, we had a little something we call the Reformation. And the Re Reformation had five main tenets. I'm sure I'll forget at least one of them, so I'm not going to try to do them all. But it was all in Latin, which is not really my strong suit. One of them was Sola Christo. Only Christ. Sola Christo. Only Christ. There are a lot of things that we can talk about when we come here. A lot of things that we can think about. A lot of things that I can say. A lot of verses we can read. Sometimes we need to simplify and I want us to remember this morning as we celebrate communion together that the focus of our lives must be Jesus Christ. Only Christ. If it's anything more than that, it's not what it needs to be. Our lives must be about Him. Everything must be about Him. And if our lives are not about Christ, if He is not at the head of our lives, if He is not at the head of our church, if we do not recognize Him as the sustainer of this world, then something is wrong. And we are not what God intended us to be. And so we're going to celebrate communion this morning. And we're going to thank God for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf. 
for making this possible, for making it possible for us to be a part of the family again, to honor, to remember, to thank Him for all that He has done for us. We're going to bow our heads and we're going to pray for a moment. And I want to challenge you this morning as, as the band comes, as the guys come, I want to challenge you to consider your life and ask yourself, is it only Christ? Is He in charge? Is He running my life? Is He running this show? Am I giving Him the honor that He is due? It's the only way that I can be the person that God intends for me to be. Paul is very clear that when we come to the communion table, when we celebrate this communion service together that we do so with pure hearts and so if there's anything in our hearts that ought not to be there any sin that needs to be confessed any difficulty that needs to be laid at God's feet we need to do that and so I want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning let's bow our heads and ask for God's working in our heart his cleansing power through the blood of Christ and his working in our lives father thank you so much for Jesus Christ he is the one He is the one who makes all things new. And that includes us. He is the one who is in charge of everything. Not only has He created this world, He sustains it. Not only has He created our bodies and our lives, but He heals them. He brings us back to where we need to be before you. It is only Christ. It is 100% Christ and none of us. Father, I pray for each individual that's here this morning. I pray that you will open their eyes, their hearts. Pray that each one of us might be honest with ourselves about where we stand before you. Recognize and give thanks for all that you have done as we, as we take this bread, as we take the cup, symbols of Christ's body that was broken, his blood that was shed. I pray that you will be honored by it. I pray that you will be rejoicing as you see us remember the sacrifice of Christ here this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Guys, if you want to come.